Well, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to the Lehman Art Department's Visiting Artists Lecture Program. Um, we're going to have a crit after, um, just through the doors here. And everyone's welcome to come and uh, to join us and watch the crit if you want to. Um, so, um, when I look at Lucas Blaylock's photos, I experience the pleasure of seeing thoughts unfolding as a series of decisions. Instead of staying faithful to observed space, Lucas bends the space in his photos into every kind of space. Deep space, shallow space, perspectival space, abstract space. Instead of hiding his tracks, he shows you his work, as if he's inviting you to think through the options and variables with him. This gives his photos a feel of paintings. So does the tactile malleability of his work. In his hands, a stuffed animal monkey becomes a sphinx. A bank of mailboxes becomes a switchboard. And a piano becomes a levitating figure in a magic trick. Uh, his thought process is so frenetic it overflows the boundaries of his photographs. At one of his shows, I found a hidden space behind the walls where, like, a secret, like secret totems, he'd hung a hidden series of photos, a sort of ghost show that ran in parallel to the public one. Um, so after looking at Lucas Blaylock's work, uh, I, I often see the world differently. It feels funnier, more fractured, and full of possibilities. Um, his pictures have been included in, in recent exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art, the Walker Art Center, the Albright Knox Art Gallery, um, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Artist books include Towards a Warm Math, uh, Windows, Mirrors, Tabletops, Inside the White Cub, and Making Memories. Um, Blaylock is also an active writer, and his interviews and essays have been published in IMA, Aperture, Foam, Moose, and Objective. And I'm very happy to introduce Lucas Blaylock. Cool. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you all for having me. Thanks for coming. Um, I was going to start uh, with this film uh, that's part of the uh, New York close-up series from Art 21, uh, which is about Photoshop. But I actually, uh, I feel like maybe we're a little tight on time, and I put on a lot of slides in this slideshow, so maybe I'm going to skip that part and just go straight into the presentation. Uh, this uh, slide about this app, uh, the last thing I'll show tonight is an augmented reality project I made uh, now like a year and a half ago. And the, the pictures on the screen are interactive. So if you download the app onto your phone, uh, you can use the phones to see what's going on uh, in the augmented reality portion of these, of these images uh, at the end of the presentation. But no, no pressure at all for that. Um, so uh, I guess I'll sort of start at the beginning. Uh, I came to photography as an undergraduate. Uh, I had grown up in North Carolina, in sort of the mountains in the, uh, the western part of the state, and had, had grown up in a family that was very far removed from art, uh, art things. And so I, I, when I was young, I got really interested in novels and in movies. Like these were sort of the, the cultural things and, and music, you know, and these were the things that were sort of available to me at the time. And it wasn't until I went, uh, I went to Bard, which is in upstate New York, for undergrad, and it wasn't until there that I sort of met a group of people who were really interested in contemporary art or in photography or in visual culture in this kind of way. And this is, a, this is a still from Blue Velvet, David Lynch's 1984 movie, which is just sort of, uh, I don't know, this was something coming out of high school that was super, super important to me. And so wanting to be a writer and being interested in movie making, or at least the idea of movie making, I, I sort of came into photography through these sort of pathways, you know? So when I got to Bard, it was in the late 90s, and it was like this moment of, uh, of storytelling and cinema in photography. These were like really loud discussions. You know, people like Gregory Crutzen and Cindy Sherman and Jeff Wall were like really like a big part of what people were talking about. So for somebody who was interested in storytelling and in movies, it felt like sort of an easy thing to address yourself to. And this is a photograph I made when I was 20, I think. Uh, it's me as Janet Lee in the, in the shower scene in Psycho. Um, and I, I think that, you know, this idea of, uh, of not quite the right thing being in the frame is something that's sort of carried through. And this, the humor in the work is something that I, I still feel kind of 
this picture still feels, uh, feels like mine, I guess, to me. And so when I was at Bard, uh, Bard's program in photography is run by Stephen Shore. Uh, this is maybe Stephen's most famous picture. Uh, and he's got a retrospective up right now at the Museum of Modern Art uh, that's huge. It's got like more than 700 pictures in it. But he, uh, he was a huge influence on me. Um, he sort of got all of his students to, to use the large format camera, so I started off shooting with a four by five really, really early on. Uh, and really sort of started thinking about the space of a picture as something that might be uh, sort of broken apart into variables and sort of um, uh, thought about as, as a sort of matrix, both on a structural level, like on a, like where to, how to frame or where to frame, but also on a cultural level, that there were, there were sort of all of these signifiers sort of built up into the picture. And I think that his sort of, his way of thinking about photographs in that way really sort of gave me some tools to think about my work uh, with a kind of different machine a little bit later. The other really big influence on me early on was Jeff Wall. Uh, and I think Jeff Wall's pictures were really interesting to me, partially because of their, of their ambition, their sort of like desire to be this, like at painting scale and these kinds of things. And all the intention that he was getting to put in them, you know, all the cinematicness that was coming in with his sort of like, uh, I don't know, setting them up or uh, the, the yeah, whatever you want to call that. But, uh, but I, I think he was also really important because he wrote a lot. Uh, so his ideas were really accessible, not only in the work, but also in a whole lot of essays that were also sort of floating around. And, and so I, I think he really, uh, between these two photographers, I think I really tried to find my position. And I, I think it's sort of interesting that at this point in time, I like think this is probably 2000. Uh, I mean, this picture was made before then, but this is my own thinking in 2000. Uh, all of the sort of creative input you might put into a photograph, or the way that I was thinking about it at least, was sort of in front of the camera. Like, you might sort of like analytically pull the world apart in the way that Stephen Shore did, or you might stage something and then photograph it in the way that Jeff Wall did. But one way or the other, or somewhere between the two, that was sort of, that was how you might author a picture. And, and so that was sort of the, the trajectory I was coming out of. And I, I was making pictures that looked like these. And I sort of worked in this vein, this sort of, uh, this vein between the, the sort of American landscape photograph and this sort of much more cinematic picture for a long time, uh, for like seven years, uh, all the way through my 20s, really. And it was, uh, I sort of hit this point where I really didn't know how to go forward. Like I really sort of hadn't found a piece of that pie that was mine, you know, like I kept sort of making projects and then folding, trying to fold them into the next project and just not really finding any traction in what I was doing at all. And I'd started making a little bit of sculpture and I'd gotten really interested in architecture and I sort of thought I was done being a photographer, honestly, in like 2006. And that summer I, I, I sort of ran into a group of things or over the next year I ran into a group of things that really shifted my thinking and shifted my relationship not only to my own work, but to sort of the idea of making photographs and what, what photography was and how I might go forward with it. And so those three things for me are illustrated here. Uh, Herman Melville's Moby Dick on the left. Uh, that's Jean-Luc Godard on the top, and this is Bertolt Brecht. And I can sort of pull apart what these three people meant to me. Um, so Moby Dick was this really fortuitous encounter. Uh, it was sort of a book that I, uh, I read because I felt like I should, you know, it, was a, it felt like part of my, my, like, my homework. Uh, and I did, and I totally loved it. Like, it's so much weirder than I was prepared for it to be. Uh, and the characters are so much, I don't know, there's just so much bizarrity, and there's like sort of, like he's collaging elements of both Shakespeare and the Bible into the book. Like, there's all sorts of stuff that I think you associate much more with the 20th century than with the 19th. And so, I think that through that book, um, and this is a picture by Gustave Le Gray uh, of, of a seascape, and this is actually a collage of two negatives. So, you know, one of the things that uh, 
I think one of the things that happened with me and Moby Dick that was so significant for me was that Moby Dick was written in 1851, which is like 10 years after photography gets invented. So it got me really interested in the way that people were thinking at a really different point in time, at a point in time that I hadn't previously felt like I had any access to. And so instead of sort of being only, I was really before then I think only interested in art after the Second World War. And so it, it just like really stretched my feeling about uh, where I might get, get influences or, or whose work I might look at for, to sort of try to feed my own. So if, if Moby Dick sort of like stretched out the space of the history I was wanting to like plow through, uh, Godard, this is a, a, a still from a film he made called Band Apart, uh, was this sort of amazing figure because, so this is this moment of Jeff Wall and also Andreas Gursky has a show up at MoMA and like there are all these things going on that's like, uh, everything is enormous. Like all of the art that I'm excited about is 10 feet wide and extremely expensive to make and I'm a young artist who doesn't have any of these resources. And so it really felt weird to be like, okay, well, how do you, how do you participate in this conversation? Like, how can you make something that feels fully fledged? I felt at the time, like, I was, I, I would make, um, I would sort of, like, come up with ideas and, and feel this tremendous amount of pressure about how to execute them, because I just didn't have the resources to do it. And I think what I found in Godard was this, Filmmaker, he's you know French New Wave, 1950s and 60s. Uh, I mean, he's still alive and still making films, but uh, but his early work really took this idea of the sort of making something on a shoestring and made it part of the aesthetic of what he was doing. So his films were shot in a way where he's uh, he's writing them as he's shooting them. They're shot with a, a camera person and maybe one or two actors, and it's just done on this sort of very uh, this sort of very bootleg condition, and. That idea that you could do something on a small scale and that could be part of like the ethos of what you were doing was really exciting to me. So, so, if, so I sort of started to stretch back and then I sort of started to feel like my authorship or like the, the kind of position I was in was maybe like my limitations were not always negative. That this could be used as a kind of asset. And so, so thinking about those two things, I started really looking a lot at the history of photography, just really being like, okay, so what did people make? And what, what might be available for me to sort of like magpie out of this situation? Uh, this is a carte de vis, which is like a postcard uh, made by, these were really popular in France in the 1880s, I think. Uh, and this is a, a multigraph. So this is a one sitter sitting in front of two, two mirrors. And so he's being photographed sort of all sides at the same time. It's a picture by Atche of the streets in Paris. And so all this work that had previously felt sort of uh, too far back for me to access, all of a sudden felt like, oh, what if I tried to make a picture that, that sort of had some of these characters? This is a Man Ray. So Paul Outerbridge uh, in modernist photography is full of pictures of eggs, which is pretty weird. Um, but it, they saw, they thought eggs were sort of the ultimate form to, to show light, you know, they're this perfect ovular shape. Uh, and so there are literally thousands and thousands of pictures of eggs. But in the Bauhaus, in your first year of photo uh, with Molinage, you could only photograph eggs in string. So that was the, there's, that's probably part of the reason. Uh, this, is a, this is a camel cigarette ad by Steichen. This is another thing, like, Things like this, the, when I was first sort of learning about photography, felt outside of what was available. Like, a commercial photograph wasn't the kind of thing that was showing up in photo history for me. This is Brancusi's photograph of one of his own sculptures. Uh, Man Ray taught him to make pictures, and I really like the tension in this picture between, like, it being a kind of, like, photograph of this object and the object sort of, like, pushing back somehow, you know, that this reflection really calls attention to the idea that it's a photograph. And so I started making pictures that looked like this. And I should say these are like 2007, 2008, and I'm definitely not the only photographer at this point who's sort of mining the history of photography, you know? Um, I, I think people like Christopher Williams was, was somebody who became really, uh, I don't know, who I saw, saw his work for the first time. Roe Etheridge was, was sort of making these kinds of pictures. So, I was sort of understanding this in my own way, but also, also through some of my peers. It's 
so, so it's saying all this, I mean, I sort of like, my way into this was to, uh, I initially started off by looking at these studio pictures that all these modernist photographers were making and being like, well, how do you make these? Because I'd never really worked in a studio before. And so I would literally just sort of set a book up and put some things on a table and it was, felt like I was practicing, you know? Like I was just sort of using these really cheap objects from my life uh, to be stand-ins for these much nicer looking objects from, the, from these older pictures I was looking at. And I was shooting with a four by five uh, and really just like on a tripod trying to figure out how to make this work. And I started getting these negatives back and I really did when I first started feel like I was practicing, you know, that I would eventually replace the crappy objects I had with better stuff and then I would make the real pictures I wanted to make. And I realized pretty quickly that it was actually like lavishing all of this attention on, on these really cheap plastic things that, that had the energy, you know? That there was a real strangeness available to me in, in, in paying so much attention to these objects that the contemporary space aren't really meant to be paid that much attention to. So I, I really sort of, that became like the, a real centerpiece of, of what I was thinking through. And it, it felt like content, you know? It felt like, it felt like I was being able to pull some of these tactics out of, out of people's work that could feel very far away from me and really address it to the world I, I was living in. So I, I made this book, uh, this is Towards Warm Math, uh, and this is really just like the first year of studio pictures that, that I made. And you can really feel, I mean, I, I think that this thing now feels like a real love letter to the history of photography. At the time, I didn't feel like that at all. Like it also feels, uh, it's got a, a certain kind of nostalgia quality that, that was also totally uh, lost on me in 2008. All right, so, so if, uh, Moby Dick opens up this space and Goddard kind of gives me permission to, to, do, uh, to do it with the means I have. Um, I, think, uh, I think the next character who I got to directly through Goddard is Brecht. Uh, and Brecht, for those of you who might not know, is a German Weimar, so it's sort of between the two world wars. Uh, theater uh, playwright, uh, theater critic, uh, dramaturge, sort of like, uh, philosopher of the theater almost, who really his project was that he felt like the world needed a, a modern theater. That the old theater, the Aristotelian theater, where you just went and sort of like disappeared into the audience and were entertained by a, by a sealed world that was being presented to you on the stage, that this wasn't uh, enough for modern conditions. That you really, that modern man and his sort of, or his or her sort of social, uh, I don't know, he was a Marxist, and so in, his, in, in all the social roles that this is, implies, that, uh, that those things should be brought out by the theater. And so his theater was called the Epic Theater, uh, and he had this idea that if you, uh, if you put on a production where you could not only saw the world that was being performed, but also were aware of the labor of that performance, that, that this is something that, um, that could, could keep your viewers awake, you know, could keep their social attitudes alive in the theater space. And so, you know, I was reading Brecht because he was the biggest influence on Godard. And so after I got really interested in Godard, I was just walking backwards, which is how I feel like I've learned most things. And, uh, and you know, I was at this point in my life where I was shooting in the studio a lot, so I was working full time and I was living in a room in a studio in, a, in an apartment in Brooklyn with two roommates. And so I had this collapsible table uh, that I would put up in the living room to make pictures on. And I would sort of come home and put it up and put a backdrop up on the wall and put up some lights. And I had this like super theatrical space. So it was really easy for me to think about how I might use a theater critic's ideas or a theater or playwright's ideas in what I was doing. And so I, uh, I, I did, I started thinking about, well, you know, okay, cool. So maybe 
maybe this sort of sealed world of the photograph is something I can interrupt. You know, maybe I can use these Brechtian ideas and, and sort of bring them out in, in what I'm doing. And I sort of really quickly realized, um, when I first started doing it, I sort of wanted to leave like a light stand in the picture. You know, I was sort of like, I was like, oh, okay, so what I'm gonna do is show the studio apparatus. And I started thinking about it uh, more and more, and I, I feel like uh, what, I really, um, what I really got to was that the thing that I was really hiding, the thing that the labor that I really didn't wanna talk about in my pictures was in Photoshop. Uh, and so I started using Photoshop uh, right after, or when I was still an undergrad, uh, because I was scanning, uh, scanning my film. And so, you know, I was just doing all the normal stuff, like dusting things and color correction and these kinds of things. And I'd always treat it as, as a kind of surrogate darkroom. You know, it was just like, I didn't have access to a darkroom. I was using this other mechanism, but it, it was just a darkroom for me. And I think as I went with it, uh, I started thinking about how it, it was really a tool of its own, you know, and it really did different things. And so I, I, in thinking about Brecht, I started to think about, about bringing this labor out, bringing the, the labor of, of the computer forward and into my pictures. And so, you know, this is like 2007, 2008. And so the only people using Photoshop at this point are professionals. Like general people are not editing their photographs, you know, like uh, only commercial photographers and artists are really playing with these tools. And so what I felt like was available to me was to make a kind of burlesque or like a kind of like slapstick version of a commercial photographer's studio. So I gave myself these procedures, like take out the bananas, except instead of doing it in a really uh, clean, clear, clean way, the way that I'd sort of been taught, uh, or that, that my anxiety as a photographer told me that I should do, I, I, I sort of opened it up and started making it like this. Or, you know, this one was, uh, you know, try to look at this tire from two, two points of view at once, you know? Uh, I mean, they're all kind of jokey. Like, there were these glasses that were sort of popular in the 70s that had this weird smoky, uh, smoky color. And I, I, I sort of, I wanted some, so I, I made them. You know, or I would erase something with a sort of low opacity clone stamp, you know, instead of, instead of letting the tool work as seamlessly as it might, I, it sort of became available to think about it, it, its failures or, or how, how your hand might get in there somewhat. And I also made some straight sort of like uh, unmanipulated pictures that went with them. Because for me, it was about relationships, you know, like I'm trying to relate to these objects and sometimes the camera is doing a really good job of that. And, and sometimes for me it's not, you know, and I, I, I need some, some, some more feeling of, uh, some more steps to try to get into the relationship that I want. So this work uh, became my first show, uh, which was in New York, uh, at a gallery called Ramek and Crucible on the Lower East Side. Uh, and it really was just like, uh, like after that, that Towards Warm Math that I showed you that was the, this first year of, of working in the studio, this was just really a continuation. You know, like this was me just sort of like, like laying down a whole lot of ideas uh, that all on some level went together. I mean, it's really, it's kind of a book on the wall in a lot of ways. So while I was doing all of this, I, I, I didn't make this picture. Uh, I, while, I was, while I was working on all of this, I, how can I say this? So I'd gotten out of, I, out of my undergraduate in 2001 and had sort of bounced around for a while. I had landed back in New York in 2007. And really, I think that was the, the moment for me when things uh, congealed. Like, the, like it really, uh, I don't know, a, a number of things happened to help that, that happen. 
But I, but I was art handling for a couple of years, and through that, I ended up uh, working for an artist. Uh, this is a work by Vic Muniz, uh, <coughs> who's uh, an artist who's Brazilian. He lives between Brazil and Brooklyn. Uh, there's a really sort of wonderful film about him called Wasteland. Uh, it's a documentary about a project he did in uh, one of the world's largest waste, dump waste dumps in Brazil. Uh, but he makes these works that are sort of simply, in shorthand, uh, a non-drawing material being used to draw a picture you probably have seen before. So this is uh, Caravaggio's Medusa uh, made in spaghetti. I think it's called Medusa Marinara. Um, and so this is what I was doing during the day. This was a full-time job. I, I managed all of his image stuff and did all the photographic end of his work. So I was sort of like working as a photographer, working as a studio assistant, and then coming home and sort of working on my own stuff. All right, and so, uh, so the story I just told is the story of like, uh, of these sort of literary influences that got me to go where I was going. Um, but the other story that sort of is important here is this, uh, this, is, this is the Google image for the phrase digital age. Uh, and um, I, I think, uh, yeah, the, the, what, it, what it meant to be a photographer and what photography meant and how photography functioned between 2001 and 2015 has moved dramatically. You know, and so part of what happened uh, came from things that were on this sort of, you know, personal scale, and then some of the things that were happening and that surround some of the issues surrounding my work were happening on this macro crazy scale. And so I think one of the things that happened in photography, sort of entering the digital age, is that it, for the first time in history, in the history of the medium, you could make a photograph without making an object. You know, you can make a photograph uh, and share it all without ever making a thing, you know? And so this caused a kind of crisis in, in art circles because artists are really interested in making things. And, and, you know, photography's art practice has always had like a really strong parallel with the ways that culture has used it, you know? So, so as advertising picked up photography, uh, art picked up a relationship to advertising, you know, like these kinds of things. Uh, and so as photography leaves objecthood uh, in most of its forms, there's a sort of real curiosity about how it might go forward. And I think there, there's sort of, uh, yeah, one of the answers here is something like this. This, this is uh, a 2011 work by Walid Beshti called Picture Made by My Hand with the Assistance of Light. And this is a piece of photographic paper, the, the size of the artist's body that he has crumpled up exposed to light, uncrumpled, crumpled again, exposed to light again. And so it's actually a photograph of itself. You know, it's a, it's a photograph just of its, of, its own, uh, of its own wrinkles. And so on one side, uh, you know, this became possible. It, it became possible to think about photography as an object-making practice. You know, it's like a, a way to almost make sculpture more than to make pictures. And, and, and this was really powerful in a, in a moment where this was also what was going on. You know, all of a sudden 2007 is Google Image and uh, Flickr comes online. Like all of a sudden there's this amazing archive of images that are at everyone's fingertips all the time. So, you know, an earlier impetus for a photographer might be to photograph the place you went on vacation. But now you literally have access to those images whether you make them or not. And so the, the sort of qualities of what it means to, to go out and participate in this way gets really, um, I don't know, the, the, the mandate becomes sort of flimsy feeling or can feel that way. And so if this is a sort of, whoops, uh, over, over object image, you know, like this is an image that's, uh, it's more important that it's an object than it is any kind of picture. This is sort of an image that is so flexible and light, and it's almost not a picture, it's almost more like a word, you know, it's like a symbol. And so, you know, we don't think about these kinds of images even having authorship or like being seen by another person. They, they sort of are just these like free floating things. And so for me, I was really like, I wasn't really into the idea of getting rid of picture making. Like I, I was excited about that part of making photographs, but I, 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 felt this, uh, I felt this object orientation. 
And I also was really kind of excited by the weird flexibility that the internet and the, the digital files and all these things were sort of proposing. But I, 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 I was looking for an in-between. And so the in-between, I sort of started to look to more, um, was painting. And painting, like 100 years before this moment, had sort of dealt with something really similar. Like there had been a real crisis of painting as an object and painting as a carrier for images. And photography, in some ways, had freed painting of the latter, you know? And, and so, uh, so this was this, but there was, there's all sorts of evidence of this thinking going on in painting. So I started looking at a lot more painting. And this, this painting gets to stand in for the whole history of painting in my talk. Uh, this is a Magritte painting from the late 40s. Uh, and I kind of love these paintings. They're called Period Vosh. Uh, and basically, he, was, he had been snubbed by a surrealist dealer in the 20s uh, in Paris. And he was still mad about it in the 40s. And so when the guy finally offered him a show, he spent five months trying to make the worst paintings he could figure out how to make. Uh, and these are some of them. Um, but they're crazy. Uh, and, uh, but but in, in looking back, like, so, you know, if I first started to look back at, at photography's history, like, this, this interest started to get wider and wider, and lots and lots of pictures started to make it into, into the way that I was thinking. And one of the other things I got from, uh, from painting was this idea of having a daily practice, right? So I feel like uh, earlier on, when I was a younger artist, I sort of made a, I made a picture, made something when I had a good idea, you know? And, and I didn't always make all that much stuff. Um, and at this point, I got really interested in what it would mean to sort of like think about making art the way that you might think about like practicing the piano or practicing like, uh, I don't know, basketball was a really big touchstone for me as a kid. Uh, and, and I started thinking about that. So what if I just went into the studio every day and basically tried to get my attention up to try to make some pictures? Uh, and so I spent, uh, I spent a couple of years really doing this really sort of uh, as rigorously as I, as I could. And this book is sort of an 18 month picture of that practice. So uh, it's sort of a studio notebook. It's not a, uh, all of the pictures in it are not works for the wall, but, uh, but it does sort of show a lot of thinking. And there are a lot of pictures in it, so I'm gonna show them really fast. Uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you all see the whole book. I guess I'll talk over it a little bit. So this, this book uh, represents also a shift in time for me. Uh, I had gone to the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in the summer of 2011, I, just prior to going to graduate school, after 10 years of deciding not to go to graduate school uh, that same year. I, and so I went to Maine for the summer and then came back through New York and then went to Los Angeles. To, I went to grad school at UCLA. And so I spent, I, so this book sort of starts when I leave New York uh, and runs through the first year and a half of my graduate degree um, and was sort of part of my thesis project there. And I made it on blurb, you know, I made a blurb book. And then uh, like a year later, I met a, a small publisher uh, who was interested in making it a real book. And so we, we, we printed it eventually.
So that's me as an old man after making all those pictures. All right, so, um, so by the time I got out of school, it was 2013, and, uh, and again, the world around photography had sort of shifted, you know? So, so what I was saying is, you know, whatever, when I first started using Photoshop, the only people using it were professionals. By 2013, Instagram was around. I, all sorts of weird apps were around. Like, everyone understood that a photograph was flexible, uh, that that information uh, could be, that, that there was sort of a, a part of photography that was about capturing the world and a part of the of photography that could be about adjusting it, you know? And that adjustment could be dramatic or really, uh, or not so dramatic at all. Like a straight picture was certainly still a possibility within this matrix, but that the photograph is a sort of like thing with really good boundaries that, that, that had a certain identity started to become much more slippery. And so I feel like that was, uh, I don't know, it really changed what I felt like I could, what was available to me as far as what kinds of things I could do, how complicated I could make the work, how, uh, how many moves I could go into making a photograph or into manipulating a picture before it quit being a photograph. Like early on that had been like one, you know, I could do one thing to it. Like after that, if I did two things, it was some sort of digital painting. Like by, the, by 2014, 2015, I, I had a, there was a lot more space in there to play with. Um, but I'm really just gonna show uh, a group of projects pretty quick uh, of uh, just sort of some of the things that I've been working on since, uh, since that second book. Um, and the first few, uh, have to do with, uh, with exhibition. I mean, I think that first, the first show I did, uh, which was in 2011, I really did put a book on the wall. And so uh, when I was given another opportunity to put up a show, I was sort of really curious about what I might, uh, how I might use architecture as sort of a way to expand the space of the kinds of things I was thinking about. Um, so these pictures, uh, we're all on a show called Id, Ed, Ed, Odd, which was also at Ramekin. Um, and so, this is a little out of order. So basically, I, this is the show that John sort of mentioned in the introduction. I, so this is the gallery space, uh, the whole thing. Uh, and we built uh, basically the largest regular rectangle you could build in this space. And this show uh, that looks like this with uh, these two pictures, uh, and then these pictures on one wall, just like really simple show with like four positions in it, um, excuse me, uh, was on the inside. So it looked like this very kind of spare show. Um, but then there was also this sort of funny opportunity to hang another show on the, on the architecture that was already there. So just like in this picture where the clone stamp sort of like cancels out the picture that was there before by making another one, like this sort of idea of, of hanging an inside show and an outside show was, was a sort of continuation of this logic. And there's a big uh, window at the front of this gallery. And so when you look through the front window, you looked into the back, like the studs on the back of a wall. And so this kind of like putting the backside in the front was something that also felt just like, a, I don't know, a, a useful metaphor for thinking about the kinds of ways I was interested in working. And so there were a few projects that sort of took up these kinds of questions. I did uh, two or three things that sort of took up architecture as the point. Um, and then I, I sort of moved on pretty quickly to, to something that felt more pressing in the work for me. Sorry for the pun. Um, which was this idea of, about the body. So I had this, like, so if there's this anxiety, uh, I didn't really describe it as an anxiety the first time, but if there's an anxiety about, uh, like one of the things about making an object is uh, that it relates to your body, right? 
You know, that the, the image on a screen is much less of a corollary to your physicality. Like we can sort of, it's like our consciousness versus digital consciousness, you know? Whereas if you're standing in front of a painting, it's kind of your body versus its body, you know? And so I was really interested in the way that the body was getting kind of subtracted from photography. And so a lot of the work I've made since this point, this was 2014, uh, has been about sort of like thinking about the body in photography and about how I might make it still important. You know, that, I, that this was a reason to make a print, you know, the to reason to take these tools that are sort of native to virtual space and sort of drag them out into, into more physical space. Um, but this was sort of a first shot at that. Uh, this is uh, from a show called Tongue Mops and Bunny Pictures. Those are the tongue mops. They're not mine. They're Andre Suta's, uh, who's a Romanian artist who makes awesome work. Um, and they were just these, uh, the, the bunny pictures, are, each one of them are called Bad Situation. And, uh, and they're just Bad Situation one through five. But I was thinking about, you know, like I wanted something to, to talk about the, uh, the sort of membrane of the photograph, and the way it, it keeps the world back behind it. And so these sort of very quickly uh, gave way to these. Um, which is sort of, these are sort of the only two serial bodies of work I've ever made. Um, but I made these pictures of hot dogs uh, that I showed in St. Louis, uh, 2015. And they were these kind of, uh, again, sort of like wanting the body, like wanting a relationship to the body. And like, as you can see in the pictures, they're really big prints. But uh, they're kind of like bad paintings, you know? They're, uh, they're, they're mark making, or a possibility of mark making. But they're also like, you know, they're kind of like fingers. I mean, they're, they're kind of gross. Um, I, think, I think even seeing them, you can kind of like think about the way hot dogs smell, you know? And, uh, and I, I sort of, I really liked all of this tangible energy that sort of came with them. And I also really liked that it was like, it looks like the Photoshop brush mark you know, it's like the Photoshop brush is kind of a hot dog maker. Uh, and so I, uh, it gave me an ability to make things like make piles and like have depth, you know, uh, things that are totally like the bodilessness of the virtual is really a big part of it. Um, so I made a lot of these. But you know, a, a hot dog is also kind of like a photograph. It's like a industrially produced picture of a sausage. I can see we're running out of time. I'm gonna just bounce through these really quick. There's also a hot dog book, of just all pictures of hot dogs. Uh, let's see, maybe I can skip this guy. Well, that's a good. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just talk about the last project. So there have been a, a series of shows. I, that have in a much less serial, literal way taken on these questions of the body, thinking about like, a, like on one side, my body, like my body being able to insert itself into the photograph by through the clone stamp or whatever. Um, but, it, but also uh, the bodies of objects, the uh, objects that particularly have a relationship to the body or feel like good analogs for the body. Um, and so this has sort of been a theme, I think, since I've been out of graduate school. Um, but this is a show that I did uh, a year and a half ago in New York uh, in a basement uh, that was called Low Comedy. And, uh, and it was sort of thinking through a lot of this stuff. This is sort of the last real exhibition I put on. Um, and it was thinking about these body questions through like a, a slightly more, um, I don't know, symbolic way, I guess. Uh, and one of the ways that, or at least one of the ways that the body came into this body of work was, uh, was through this technology, was, th was thinking about all of these things that we know how to use, like a cigarette or the newspaper, you know, or uh, a knife, or this one's called switchboard, or this one's a piano, you know? And like, these are all tools that we would know how to use if no one ever told us. Like, it, it becomes really obvious uh, how you might apply yourself to a piano. Or, or what a switchboard, you know, that a switchboard literally makes connections and that those connections go somewhere is something that's, this is a really intuitive tool. 
And so I was really interested in the way that that, uh, that that ease of use with the body sat against Photoshop, which has no, like none of that is, uh, is easy to figure out. And none of it is, is a direct extension in any way. So I, I was sort of, uh, was thinking about those kinds of things and bringing these, these, all these other tools into the room to try to get them to think off of this one that, uh, that, was, that was ever present and less, uh, less intuitive. So this one is called uh, Financial Times Morning Edition. Uh, and this is the evening edition. You'll notice all that changes is the window light. Um, and you know, this idea of versions is something digital, digital space has given us and makes, makes super available. Uh, this is Double Recipe. This is Switchboard. Uh, this is Covered Piano. Tessa Sitting. This one's called Thing Song. Another Shadow. This is the monkey uh, as a sphinx that John mentioned. Uh, it's called More Monkey. This one's called The Cop. You can see the shadow of the cop over there to the left. Um, and I, I think that I'm working on a show right now uh, that'll open in Switzerland in March. Uh, and it's, it's directly a continuation of these kinds of ideas and really trying to think through them. Uh, so the last thing I'm gonna show really quickly is this, which is, this is, the, uh, this is the promised augmented reality project from the beginning of the presentation. And if you guys have, uh, did download the app, you can check it out. Uh, it's, it comes, in, it exists in two versions. Uh, this was uh, a performance space at a book fair at the Tate in London uh, from two springs ago. Uh, and basically what I had been commissioned, the, the publisher I'd worked with um, to make the hot dog book uh, had approached me about doing another project. And he had been commissioned to do this performance space and ask if I would like to collaborate with this woman who makes augmented reality. To, uh, to make some panels to enclose this space. Uh, and so I, I met her and we made this project together. But you guys can move around actually if you want. It's, uh, it kind of works better if, if, you're, uh, if you're not stationary. But they all do different things. Uh, so for those of you who can't see this one, if I, uh, what does this one do? Oh, it's 3D. Try to look around the side of the object if you can. So, and you can circle it the other way too. This one, uh, the Photoshop layers sort of separate and you can sort of look between them. Uh, this one, eventually, it sort of becomes an architectural space, but musical notes will start coming out of it. And it's sort of a nice one because they can actually like float off into the room, um, which is pretty wild. I, that was really surprising to me when that worked. Um, this one, uh, the telephone rings, and if your phone is, uh, yeah, if your ringer's on, it'll, it'll make your phone ring. Um, and then objects appear. Yeah. It's weird. But I mean, in some ways, like, all of this is, like, me getting to push the sort of, uh, the virtual that's between us and the world, like, out past the picture plane, you know? Uh, it's, it also involves your phone, which is complicated. Uh, but it was really interesting to work on. This, is, uh, this one just disappears. I did this project really quickly. If, if I, one of the things I would do a little differently if I could redo it is that eventually parts of this would reappear, but they do not. Uh, this one, the hands come down over your phone because you're scared of blood. Uh, these are little Vienna sausages, and I imagined them, uh, they're, what they're doing when they animate is that they're sort of curling. I, I sort of imagine them trying to become real sausages, uh, which is, I think, this sort of like idea of a thing aspiring to be a, a more of a thing is something that is, shows up in my work a lot. And then this is the last one. Uh, and this, this picture is the back of the first object, and so you can see through it back to its, its front. But uh, 
Yeah, I think we're, uh, I think we're out of time. But, uh, but yeah, thank you all so much. So, uh, you know, the, I've seen the videos online of you in your studio working, and I'm, I'm curious, since you're sort of so well known for your Photoshop manipulations, that you still shoot with a 4 by 5 Yeah. It, can you explain that mm -hmm. sort of, like, for those of you who don't know, 4x5 is a film technology from the 19 teens or so. And so it's a very sort of traditional way of making photographs, but it's also digitized and yeah so it's yeah it's like the cape the you know like the whole nine yards I I mean partially it's because I sort of fell in love with the technology and was using it before I was doing any of the other stuff right so um, it's a really cool tool you can move the front plane and the back plane of the camera independently from each other which allows you to control things like focus and perspective in ways you can't do with a normal more a, a more uh, more modern camera, I guess, and so so that's part of it. Uh, part of it is I, I love the limitation of like I can only shoot so much film, and so it, it I don't see it as I'm making it, and so it takes a while for them to come back. Uh, and then I really there's like a I have to care about what it is, you know, like I can't just make another one. I mean I could, but it would require sort of me reinserting myself into the space. And so there's like a, like I feel like the Photoshop stuff is often about, I figured it out through fixing four by five, right? So I was correcting things and, and that idea of correction and of trying to, to make something work that's not quite working is something that I feel like is still really alive in the work. And now I feel like the fact that I film capture is not that important, but the perspective stuff, like I use a lot of camera movements and things, and like that stuff is important to me. And I, I don't know, it just, uh, if someone gave me, uh, gave me some sort of camera that I could do all that stuff with, and it would just capture digitally, I would, I would use it. But I, it doesn't feel like, it used to feel important that I had a foot in both worlds. Now it feels less so, but it's, it still feels like the best tool to get to what I want to what I want to get to. I may have missed this, but um, I was just interested in the hot dogs and like where that came from. Was that part of the daily practice? And yeah, right. sure. Um, and I can kind of show you. Uh, so there was uh, when I was yeah when I was sort of working through yeah when I was I was just sort of like looking for subjects all the time. I. You know, I, there was a lot of 99 cent store and a lot of grocery store um, shopping going on. Uh, and I made this one picture, which if I can find quickly, I'll put on the screen, but I may not be able to. Uh, I made this one picture during that period of time with some hot dogs and the pad from a crutch um, that looks kind of like a bun. And it was really, it was awkward. Um, it kind of, it really worked as a picture, which was great, you know? But it, uh, it, they were really awful to work with. Like they smell bad, they kind of dehydrate under the lights. Like you have to like, you know, you're like touching them and then you want to touch the camera and you're washing your hands. It's just, they're gnarly. So I, uh, I remember just being kind of uncomfortable making them. And it was like two years later and I was, um, I, f I think I was feeling a little too in control in the studio. It was like the middle of winter and I d wasn't really photographing outside much and I was photographing a lot of plastic objects and I just felt like, I don't know, I was on autopilot or something. So I was trying to give myself problems, like things that would give me a little friction and I thought of hot dogs again. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> not particularly. Like, uh, yeah, and those did not get eaten. They don't do well after being photographed. I. Uh, but they, uh, they, I made, I thought I would make one picture. I went to the store, bought a bunch of hot dogs, came home, was like, oh, this will be uncomfortable. And, and then I, it, like I, I made like 20 sheets of film then. I shot like 20 sheets of film of them that night and knew that then I wasn't, like I had more ideas. And so I was like, oh, okay. And so, Next week, I bought some more hot dogs. And so and then it just sort of be, it bloomed, but it, it wasn't so intentional. Uh, all the things that sort of, all the meaning that I found accumulating around them 
I think was there, but it, it was a surprise. Um, <clears throat> what has been the most typical uh, project that you've come to yourself as an artist? And like, what boundaries have you like, set yourself up and cross over? Because I, I mean, like, you know, like I said, like, I look at your work previously and I see, like, you incorporate a lot of um, food, for instance. Sure. And um, along with that, you incorporate your own shop. And I'm just like, I look at the photos and I'm like, you know, like, does he ever get stuck at one moment and realize, like, wait, I can do this and stuff? So I just want to know from your aspect, like, how do you, like, overcome those obstacles? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I think you get stuck all the time. You know, and I feel like doubt is a huge part of making art. And it's, it's if you're not haunted by it, I feel like maybe you're not doing the right thing. You know, so uh, I think uh, I think one of the hardest things for me was just giving myself permission to find a way to make what I wanted to make. You know, it's like I think when I started, like I was saying, you know, there was all the all the work that I felt I. Uh, I think I was like, I felt like I had ambitions towards was out of my league kind of, you know, like I just couldn't make it. Like I didn't have the, I didn't have the resources to make it. And so I think that moment where I, I sort of like came to understand, understand that I could, that there were conventions and there was a set of rules and that they could be bent, you know, and that I could, I could love them and kind of push toward breaking them, that that was, uh, that was really exciting, you know? So, I think, I mean, in some ways I've given myself, I think some artists give themselves more uh, concrete challenges than I have. Like in some ways I've allowed myself to make the work I can make every day, you know? And that, keeping myself interested in that, like, like I, I, my archive of stuff, I, like the, 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 the big whatever set of folder boxes or whatever, I, is called techniques in marriage, you know? And it's sort of this idea, like, how do you love something? How do you love something for the rest of your life? Like, how do you stay involved? Like, how do you keep being a photographer? And I feel like that's been more of the challenge to me than it has been like technical hurdles or, or sort of like uh, daunting sort of like uh, new projects, you know? It's sort of been like, okay, well, how do I keep doing this? How do I, how do I make it interesting enough to, to keep, keep myself in it? How long have you been, um, I know you said, you know, in the 20s, but how long have you been? And um, in those um, moments when you're talking about uh, getting stuck, do you call those like dry or, uh, you know, is your creative process in, in those moments, um, you know, what's your, what's your inspiration? Sure. Um. Yeah, so I started making pictures. I started ma working with photography in probably like, uh, yeah, like 98 or 99. So like it's been about 20 years since I started making pictures. I started making the body of work that is this body of work probably around 2007. Uh, and I think that I, I think what I kind of figured out for myself was that I really just needed to make stuff regardless like I actually kind of like it's weird like if I if I make like I'll have I'll have periods of time where I feel like I'm like really it's coming easy and I'm like on it and it's good you know and and then the next six months it'll be it won't feel good at all but if I look back at both of those periods of time I kind of seem to find that I make about as many works in both periods of time you know, like if I force myself to sort of like grind through the slow parts, that's like giving myself something that's, that's an activity, like a thing that I can just apply myself to and try to work through has been the most important thing for me. So it's like, I feel like when I was a younger artist, I really wanted to, like if I didn't have an idea, if I felt stuck, it was something that like, uh, I, would, I, I wouldn't make anything, you know? And I think that that was a really, that, that was kind of the worst for me. Like I, I just sink in the mud, you know? And so for me, it's best if I'm just keep moving, whether that's comfortable or not, you know? It's like, yeah, it's like being streaky, you know, with anything, you know? It's like sometimes you're hot, sometimes you're not, but you gotta kind of just keep, keep going and it'll pick back up. Like it's rhythmic, I think, at least it is for me. 
seen a Chuck Close thing, but inspiration is for amateurs, the rest of us just get to work. No, no, but that's pretty good. I kind of agree. Cool. Okay, thanks so much, Lucas. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Joe.